Welcome to Small Talk, where each week we sit down to discuss the sermon-based small group questions at Wallula Christian Church. Well, hey, we are back for another episode of Small Talk. We uh, are glad to be with you and uh, glad you're joining us. And so uh, just Craig and I both uh, say welcome and uh, it's good to be back. Had a week off. Everyone was on vacation. Everyone was gone. So we uh, took a weird week in the office. Yeah, a little, little different. And uh, we took last week off, but we're good, glad to be back this week as we continue in this series, uh, Greater Than, Less Than, where uh, uh, we've been working our way through the book of Hebrews for much of the year. And uh, this week's uh, section of scripture is the last part of Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 28. And we're just going to take a, a little closer look and, and do a few pieces of this uh, scripture of this this morning, this evening, this afternoon, whenever you're listening to this, I really don't know. You know, it could be. I don't know. Yeah, maybe morning if people wait for the for it to be published. Right, it goes out at seven a.m. on Wednesday, so maybe there's seven a.m. Just, just as soon they're just waiting, wait, they can't, waking up yeah, just to hear us. Just just at seven a.m. <laughs> I can't imagine, but anyway. <laughs> so, I want to begin with uh, just this uh, uh, silly question. I hope it makes some sense. Here, Craig, it says this, what is a tool, some kind of technology, or just a process, something in your life that changed the way you used to do something? You changed your habit, changed your process, changed the tool that you used, that you would never give up and go back to the old way of accomplishing a task. Has something just revolutionized the way you go about doing something? Yeah. First thing I thought of is how I boil water. Which sounds really silly. Awesome. I I can't wait to hear this. I'm going to explain this. Yeah. Um, As it's known, I enjoy coffee quite a bit. Okay. So when I started making, I I kind of got into it because I lived with a barista in college. All right. That was kind of the gateway into this whole coffee fascination. You had a hookup. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so there's style of making coffee called pour over where it's like... A little. It, it looks like when you use an automatic coffee maker, mm-hmm. you put the grounds in the like yeah. little filter. And it sits in there. It's kind of like that, but it's just open on top, and you manually do it yourself. You pour the water over the beans or the grounds. Right. And uh, a lot of people use a gooseneck kettle because it's sure. easier to control and all that yeah. stuff. So the way I used to do it was I had like a normal tea kettle on the stove, mm-hmm. warm up the water, and then I got a gooseneck kettle. Okay. So I'd warm it up in one kettle, pour it into the next one, and then I'd start making my coffee. Right. And I got used to it. It was fine. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, I think this was my 30th birthday, uh, Haley got me an electric kettle. Okay. And the electric kettle is also a gooseneck kettle. So it's like all in one. Right. And you can set the temperature on it. All right. And uh, once it gets to temperature, it holds it for an hour. Hmm. So in the the life I live with three kids, right. it's great because I put the water in yep. and I push the button and I just walk away. And whenever I come back, if I'm tending to kids, who knows when I'm coming back to the kitchen. Right. But I'm able to come back and my water is just hot and it's waiting for me. It's ready to go. It's amazing. To pour over <laughs> your coffee grounds. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's one of those things like once I started using it, uh-huh. I was like, man. This is actually pretty amazing. All right. I don't want to warm up water on a stove. Sure, no. Ever again. Like a peasant. You <laughs> wouldn't do that. No. So now, I, I have so many questions, but a, a gooseneck is just, it's bent over. Yeah, it's like, so like on a normal kettle, I guess the spout is kind of like up on the side, sure. you know? Yeah. On these, Kind it's, of 45 degrees sort of right. thing. Yeah. On these, it's towards the bottom, and the spout is really thin, oh, and it kind of comes up. Oh, it goes up and curves over. Yeah. So then you get like a small stream so that comes out. So it pours out slower, it does. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Easier to mm-hmm. maneuver and. Right. I guess. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I think I'm clicking with you now. Yeah. I, I know what this is. To me, this is very Downton Abbey, kind of that era. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of, I guess of of kettle, you yeah. know, like fancy kind of. I've seen yeah, like older because I guess I think yeah in 
like UK, yeah, their tea kettles that I've seen have right. that on there, right? So that would make sense. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, and so when you pour over your coffee grounds, when you use this method to make the coffee, mm-hmm. then it's just sort of it's ready. I mean, you just pour it over, and it goes into your mug. Or yeah, I usually do it into a mug. Into a mug, so and then the coffee is ready. Yeah. I see. Mm-hmm. Right. And the whole thing, yeah, it's... Uh, people are like, why do you do this? Right. And that's a great question. Yeah. Why do I do this? And... Uh, why is it different than, like, a drip coffee maker? Yeah. Yeah. So the main reason that this got started and so popular is you're able to... Uh, control where the water goes okay because and the temperature that's another thing because like we have a coffee maker at home right use it every once in a while but those just shoot the water into the middle of the beans yeah and it like saturates those right but when you're doing it yourself you get like even water around dispersed around the coffee grounds sure so that's a big deal for it right and then you control like how much is in there yeah all these things that has to mostly be like the what the original way to make coffee, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, how how did people make coffee before coffee makers? That's got to be right. kind of it. It right? really is, yeah, yeah. I was watching. Uh, sure. Oh, what was the show? It was a show from the seventies, and I saw in the background in the kitchen a little like pour over coffee thing. Yeah. So it's been around for right super long time. Right. Since the seventies, at least. I mean, if you've been around <laughs> since the seventies, you are. It's funny because they're like old in the coffee world. They keep coming up with all of these different right. gadgets and stuff. Yeah, but the like tried and true stuff. It's been around for yeah. a super long time. Sure, yeah. sure. There you go. Well, good. That's awesome. Yeah, and so you wouldn't go back. You wouldn't. I just yeah. no. I'm never. It's so convenient. Boiling water on the stove again. I've got. I at least haven't boiled water on the stove for three years now. Really? Yep. At, for coffee? <laughs> Maybe for... No, at all. Not at all? Because even if I'm making hot chocolate mm-hmm. or something, I have that electric kettle. I just use that. You just use that? Yeah. What if you're making the kids like macaroni and cheese? Uh, I guess, yes. I do yeah, little, so for like, cooking saucepan, or for cooking, something yeah. like that. Right. Yeah, see, I knew. You caught me. I knew, I knew. <laughs> yeah, well, I mine kind of is... Uh, not as sophisticated as that, I don't think, but it, it has to do with surprisingly enough food as well. Um, I was, uh, I'm, a, I, w- we like popcorn at our house. You know, I'm a big popcorn guy. I like popcorn and mm-hmm. grew up, you know, that was kind of, we, we'd had, my folks had an air popcorn popper, yeah. hot air popcorn popper, and we had popcorn. Uh, quite a bit and, and all those things. And through the years, we've had different kinds of popcorn contraptions mm-hmm. to, to make the popcorn and the hot air popcorn popper and we had one that used the oil and spun and, and yeah. did that and sherry always talks about her grandparents who only made it on the stove top in a pan kind of thing which is uh, sort of delicious when it turns out right yeah. and all that and, and not when it doesn't and so uh, and messy and all those things yeah. So yeah yeah and just uh last week while we were on vacation we we're walking through a grocery store and they had uh on on kind of the end cap of one of the aisles you know they had these uh I remember them like when you went camping for some trip and they were, you know, the popcorn and the little tin pie mm-hmm. pan with the little, little handle. handle oh, and yeah. Shake over the We used to do those going, going camping. Right, which is a terrible idea because it's a little bitty handle. <laughs> a and metal handle. <laughs> yes, and you're so close <laughs> to the fire to do it and you're like, ah. <laughs> and it rarely worked very well either, as I recall. But Sherry's like, do they they still make these? And I'm like, evidently, because we're looking at them yeah. right here. here I haven't they seen are. one in a while. No, no. And and so anyway, one one year, several years ago, uh, I think for Christmas, one one of the kids, Lacey, got me this. Uh, it's a bowl. It's a collapsible bowl. Mm. And I'm going to say it's silicone. I don't know really what it's made of, but that's kind of yeah. rubbery, plasticky mm-hmm. kind of thing. Collapsible bowl that you put the popcorn in and a little bit of oil if you want. And oh, yeah. Put a lid on and you microwave it. But it's, you know, not not the microwave bag of popcorn. And yeah. so um, 
So when I make popcorn, I, I like to use the microwave popcorn bowl. Nice. So that's, you know, I wouldn't go back to any of those other things. <laughs> they were kind of terrible or whatever. So that, Also, I just feel like I have to let it be known that you were eating popcorn before we recorded this podcast. Yes, I was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but not in the bowl. I'm at work. I just had yeah. a bag of do what you gotta microwave. Do. Yeah, you get by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there you go. Uh, uh, so probably all of us have had something that uh, has changed one of our habits or one of our the ways we we do things mm-hmm. and maybe picked up a new tool and you know and oh yeah I can't go back to using this old one and and was really the theme of really is the theme of the book of Hebrews is that hey we uh, you know there is a better way in Jesus yeah. and and uh, and that's sort of what we're talking about again today as we consider uh, grace is greater than the law. We're thinking about those two priesthoods that the author of Hebrews has been discussing, and and now we're kind of filling out that conversation here in uh, the end of chapter 7. And uh, it's really interesting, in verses 18 and 19 of, of chapter 7 of Hebrews, uh, it says this, "...the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced, by which we draw near to God." Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I just think really interesting verses, there's this phrase that describes this command, or uh, the NIV says regulation, you know, the, the point here is the, the law, I think specifically we're talking about the Levitical priesthood, that's the conversation that's going on, right, yeah. but maybe it's a little broader than that, but it describes it as weak and useless, which is just sort of interesting. And then this question asks, why is our hope, uh, why is our hope in Christ a better hope? So, so what are we thinking about this? You know, mm-hmm. how do we make sense of this? What's it mean that the law was weak and useless? And then how's that tied up in our better hope in Jesus? Yeah, that's a great question because I didn't sit and dwell on that those two words very much when mm-hmm. I was reading it right? until I read this question. Yeah. When it says weak and useless, yeah. it's like, well, that's pretty strong. Right. <laughs> strong way to talk about something. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I just did kind of my thoughts on uh, comparing the two of why would the author say that the former was weak and useless? Um, and one of my, my train of thought was kind of like, what do we receiving through Jesus and what is the author getting at and first I thought about uh, the relationship aspect of what we receive through Jesus um, because of his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection and ascension uh, it secures our eternal relationship with God from now until eternity Um, and the law was not able to really facilitate that Right. or make that a permanent thing. Right. There was uh, limited or some access for <laughs> certain people. It was mm-hmm. lots of regulations and steps and ways to go about having a relationship with God. And in that regard, the law was weak or, I guess, useless in having that type of relationship. Uh, so then the better hope through Jesus is that we do have the hope of a relationship with God and not just now, but the relationship that will, that is to come is even better than what we're experiencing now because it's going to be, we're in the presence of him and that relationship will be perfect. So that's kind of where I started thinking. And then as I was going through this and thinking about better hope, uh, the word hope made me think of first Peter uh, First Peter chapter 1, 3 through 5. So I'll read that real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So this passage is it's pointing to eternity and describing right. there's three descriptions of what that is like undefiled unfading uh imperishable mm-hmm. and really 
that's what is being described about Jesus in this passage too. Because hmm. like we've talked about, there's this comparison, uh, this Melchizedek is the type right. that helps us really see why Jesus is better. Right. And the the words that are used are kind of similar to what's talked about later on in chapter 7, that Jesus as the high priest is the high priest that is imperishable, mm-hmm. that he was undefiled in right. his life on earth and now sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, and he is unfading in time and in his priesthood, his sacrifice. It's once for all. It's never going to go away. Right. And so that's what makes it better. So not only is what Peter's talking about, this eternity we look forward to, how good it is, but Jesus is the one that makes it so good for us yeah. to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. Good ideas. And and I think just to uh, kind of tag along on those ideas, I, I read this and I, I thought a, a few things and a couple different verses that I want to take a quick look at. And, uh, you know, I... I don't think probably Paul wrote Hebrews, but I can understand where this thought comes from, you know, and why some folks traditionally people have Mm -hmm. looked at Paul as the author of Hebrews, because some of these themes are are picked up, you know, pretty clearly, you know, there's a, there's an emphasis in these same sorts of themes in other places, uh, other letters that Paul wrote. I was seeing that more so, I think, when yeah. studying this part. Yes. I saw Romans R- pop right. up a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I want to look at Romans uh, chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 4, which say, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so I think you see the overlap in themes there that this idea that the law is unable to do something it can't complete the task and Mm -hmm. and so what's the law unable to do or as the author of hebrews says here in chapter seven why is it why is it weak and powerless you know what 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 can't it finish and wrap up and and i think it's just this you know it's the it's the gospel right yeah it's the idea that you know the the law is unable to justify us it's unable to make us right with God. And, uh, and, and Paul gets to this in, in Romans eight a little bit in that it's not, you know, where I, it's really hard as someone who teaches God's word to sort of say, well, God's word isn't enough. Right. Right. And, and you have to be careful. That's not what we're saying mm-hmm. exactly. Um, but you know, God's word points out that we're a sinner. That's the job. We're going to talk about this in just a minute. That's one of the major jobs of Scripture, and that's what it does absolute, to its fullest capacity. You know, yeah. it's not that the law is useless. It's just done its job to this point. Mm-hmm. And um, there there has to be something more, and Jesus is that something more. And uh, But, uh, you know, you think about this, and, and, okay, well, it's not enough to justify us. It points out our sin, but it doesn't make us right with God. You know, we fall short of the glory of God. We don't, none of us live up 100% to the law, to God's standard. We just fail to meet that standard. And so the law is unable to justify us and the law is unable to sanctify us. Mm -hmm. You you know, we, you know, it's sort of, it just follows suit. Well, if we fall short of that standard, if we can't be made right with God, then, then how does the law help us to grow? And, and uh, we just need, we need outside support (laughs) in order for that to happen. And, and so it doesn't happen until we live by the spirit, Romans chapter eight, Mm -hmm. you know, verse four talks about the fact. And, and so it's just when we say yes to Jesus, the spirit moves in and he makes us new from the inside out. And so the spirit accomplishes this relationship with Jesus, Jesus as high priest, however you want to talk about it, it Mm -hmm. accomplishes what the law fails to do, which is to justify and to sanctify uh, completely. Mm Mm-hmm. And and so Jesus does all of that, and, and it really you know Paul 
in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 24 to 25, he says, So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. And here, I, I think there's a little more positive spin on this. Yeah. <laughs> right? It, it's, we're talking about the same thing. We're saying the same thing. The, the law was to, to hold us over, right? Mm-hmm. It, was, it was kind of that that snack before dinner time sort of thing. It's it's to get us through, but now there's no need for that any longer mm-hmm. because Jesus fulfills it and he rescues us and he justifies and sanctifies and uh, and makes a way for us to well the author of Hebrews says draw near to God. Yeah. Right? We can we can grow in this relationship with him because of um, the 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 spirit because of a relationship with Jesus. And, and so I I love the Galatians passage because it's just a little more positive. You it know, is. Think of it as a guardian, mm-hmm. somebody who's sort of, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, maybe this is too uh, obtuse or, or not, but like a foster parent, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you know, somebody who's who's taking care, who's looking out for, um, and uh, uh but we need a greater relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still that need for a yeah. a, a bigger relationship. It, re- it reminded me when you were talking about that. One of the commentaries I read is kind of just the author opinion on some of this stuff. Yeah. But it does line up with how Galatians talks about it. He was saying that people a lot of the times look at the law and they're just kind of like, that was bad. Or right. it has a negative connotation sort of thing. Right, and they were talking about how it wasn't bad, and that's not what Hebrews is saying either. Right, it it did its job and it functioned. It's not like right. God did that, and he was like, "Oh gosh, I screwed up." <laughs> right, better send Jesus in. But it served a purpose, and it was God's design. But there's just something better. Yeah, it's just like the old ways of making popcorn. Right, those aren't yeah. bad, but sure. there's something that's better. Right, and the, that's what is really being said here. It's like something was good and designed by God. Yeah. But then now we're in this stage, like use the word dispensation, yeah. how God deals with humanity. Right. We're in a place where we have something better now. Right. And we have to realize that. Yeah. Well, when you read through the Gospels and kind of the whole, the the storyline of the Gospels has Jesus being confronted by and confronting this these religious leaders, you know, the Pharisees, and we think of the Pharisees as bad guys and uh, bad guys in the Gospels, and I suppose that's a little bit fair. But the, this whole confrontation happens because they are they are simply unable to set aside these regulations, yeah. the law, and and to see Jesus, which is what the author of Hebrews is calling. Uh, Jewish Christians, in particular, his original audience, to do. Mm-hmm. I, you know, the the words were used in verse eighteen. This former regulation is set aside because it's weak and useless, right? And why do we set that aside? Well, we set it aside so we can see and meet and grow in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, I, I, the same thing's true for us today, right? When we get to a point where we build this list of of do's and don'ts, and we live by them so closely that we, it, it, they can get to a place where they get in the way of Jesus. We have to set those things aside so that we can see him. If we're so, if Jesus came uh, to cure our double trouble, which is guilt in a sinful heart. Mm-hmm. And what the law does is it, you know, Paul talked about the weakening of the flesh in regards to the law. The law magnifies that. Mm-hmm. You know, if we're if we have trouble with guilt, then the the law compounds it. It just keeps pointing us to that fact. And in a relationship with Jesus ought to cure that double trouble. You know, it, it cures the the penalty for sin, sure, but it cures the guilt that goes along with that as well. And mm-hmm. so um, yeah, it, it definitely is a better hope yeah. there. Yeah. Well, let's let's think about this next question. How about that? Yep. Are we good? Mm-hmm. Let's do it. it. It's it asks this: How does Jesus' nonstop prayer for you help you to hold firmly to your faith and persevere in the race? 
Yeah, and this is from uh, verse 25. Mm-hmm. I guess I can go ahead and read it real quick. Um, it says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And really, this just is kind of a continuation of what we were already talking about. Yeah. And it makes sense as you're further down in the passage, the chapter of Hebrews here. Uh, but the at this point, the author is really leaning into the fact that like Jesus as high priest is better than Melchizedek. Right. He's ascended and, and living and sitting at the right hand of God. And that word intercession, uh, we hear that a lot, I yeah. think, in the church. And one of the commentary commentaries I was reading the um, I've been using a lot, it's the, from the Tyndale series. I can't remember who the author is, but um, gave the definition, which I think is just good to uh, do. So it said the definition to intercede means to approach or appeal to someone, uh, approach someone on someone else's behalf. And he went through kind of some of the interpretations that some people have from this. Uh, but the main thing is the idea of Jesus praying to the Father, or uh, he said even like a vocal impassioned prayer for us. Sure. And then the continual presentation to God of the sacrifice that Jesus made on earth. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the what we were talking about was the Levitical law, these sacrifices. Mm-hmm. They were temporary things that... Right. Didn't fully accomplish the relationship aspect of drawing close to God and and having that uh, relationship available to us. So that's one of the the things I thought about is the fact that Jesus is continuing in his priesthood. Right. In uh, in his ascension. And that's what, uh, somewhere on here, I can't remember what verse it was. Oh, yeah. And if you go back one, it says, but he holds his priesthood permanently mm-hmm. because he continues forever. And so we get that idea of time going on, right. eternal priesthood. And then it's not just the eternal priesthood, but it's a priesthood that's like we were, I was talking about First Peter, unchanging. Mm-hmm. He's going to remain. That sacrifice will remain. It's once for all. Right. It's not going to change. Right. And And so that is something that, should help us to hold on to our faith and persevere. And it's interesting because I was thinking back to some of the things we already talked about in Hebrews, all those warnings of drifting away. Yeah. And over and over that kind of pops up throughout those beginning chapters. We talked about those a lot. And I think that this right here is like almost like it's kind of building to this point. There's all these warnings that we shouldn't be drifting away to hold fast to our faith and Mm -hmm. and hold firm to Jesus. And then we look at him and that's exactly what he's doing for us. He's permanent and forever. Right. And, uh, sitting, you know, the imagery is sitting right next to God interceding for us. So he's not going to drift away. Right. And that should be a huge encouragement for us in holding fast and not drifting away. Yeah. And so that's, that was one of the things I thought of, um, and then I, I was kind of thinking back to, to, uh, cause we're talking about Mel- Melchizedek in this chapter and we talked a little bit ago, we did like a comparison of old Testament priest and, mm-hmm. and Jesus, but it's interesting. Some of the details that you get in the description of old Testament priests and what they did. Uh, and I thought about, uh, Exodus, I had to go look it up. I knew it was somewhere. Uh, Exodus twenty eight twenty nine uh, says, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place uh, to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. Mm-hmm. So we're, we were talking about, you know, Melchizedek is this type right. and foreshadow. And there's all these little details mm-hmm. in the Old Testament where, yeah. like this, like the, the Levitical right. priest is presenting the names of the people of Israel yeah. to God. Right. And that's the picture we get, but it's better. <laughs> yeah. Jesus is doing that yeah. continually forever right. for us, presenting us uh, our prayers and interceding, yeah. reminding of the sacrifice, all this stuff. Right. And so that's, yeah, that's why it's better. Yeah. It's just 
it, it's there and it's solid and firm. Yeah. We have assurance of that. Right. Yeah. To me, I, I think sometimes, uh, you know, maybe things just for me personally, prayer is, is something that sometimes is, is just, uh, you know, a, a difficult idea to wrap my mind around. And, mm-hmm. and I think sometimes, am I doing this right? You know, uh, do I, do I have this together? How can my prayer life be improved? And, and, and one of the great encouragements from this passage to me is, man, this is, you, you know, we have the, we have the ear of the, the guy, right? I mean, if you can talk to the, if you can talk to the guy in charge, you know, mm-hmm. why are you wasting time with the manager? You know, just go to the owner, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you can deal with him, then let's deal with him mm-hmm. and let's, let's take advantage of that relationship. And, and we do that in other areas of our life, don't we? I mean, if we can kind of uh, skip the red tape, then we're going to skip the red tape. Yeah. And, and we're going to take advantage of that relationship. And, and to me, that's the promise of this. Look, we have this access to the, the throne room. You know, the author of Hebrews, I think in chapter 4, right, he said, go boldly into yep. the throne room of God. And this, this is our opportunity to do that. And, and it ought to be such an encouragement to us in our prayer life that we don't have to worry about getting it right, so to speak. There's no magic formula yeah. to prayer that, that sometimes we, we, we think. And, and uh, man, it's just so awesome to think we have this Jesus who, you know, I love this phrase, saves us to the uttermost. You know, that Greek word that's tr- translated as uttermost can mean has a sense of, of completeness and, uh, or, and, and a sense of always. You know this. Yeah. You know you you talked about it forever. It goes on and on. It doesn't change, and it's eternal. And and so just that idea that uh, Jesus saves us to the uttermost. Now we have the opportunity to to talk with Him, and we don't we we don't have to get it right. Uh, you know, I'm reading this book as we're working our way through Hebrews. I should have wrote down the title. It's Holy Grit, I I think, is the right title, and it just. Uh, it's a it kind of a commentary on Hebrews, but mm-hmm. it just, you know, writing through these. And the author of that says, you know, when we pray, we have a habit of ending our prayer. You know, sometimes we have things we do all the time in prayer, mm-hmm. and that's yeah. probably good and bad or yeah. whatever. But, <laughs> you know, we, we do it almost without thinking sometimes. Yeah. And so we end our prayer with, you know, in, in the name of Jesus or in Jesus' name, amen. And he said, well, that's sort of the element of, NOP of our prayer, you know, and you think about the alphabet song, you just mm-hmm. recite those right. letters almost as one, right? <laughs> Without thinking, it just rolls through yeah. it. And uh, and so sometimes we have stuff like that in prayer uh-huh. where we say it or we think it or we write it or whatever, however we're praying, and it's almost without thought. But man, we ought not skip past, the author says, you know, we ought to pay attention to this because mm-hmm. it's such a great privilege. It's so powerful that we can pray in the name of Jesus uh, and, yeah. and that, you know, he's praying on our behalf when we're not sure what to pray. He's interceding for us. It's, uh, you know, I think about some different faith backgrounds sometimes, and maybe this is why prayer gets complicated for us because there are different spiritual backgrounds that'll say well you ought to be praying to uh you know maybe a saint Mm -hmm. who (laughs) you know has better access to god kind of the best to frame that theology and the best that doctrine in the best possible light is you're you're praying to a saint because they have better access to god and you're just asking them to intercede on your behalf and and you think okay well that sort of makes sense except that (laughs) <laughs> yeah. This is the point of Hebrew 7. Yeah. You know, we don't need another intermediary mm-hmm. of any kind, right? We don't need an earthly high priest. We don't need uh somebody who lived a good enough life or did good enough things or or whatever who has passed and like they have better access to Je- they don't have better access to Jesus. They're not closer to him. Yeah. You know, here we are. We have this uh this immediate access to to Jesus. And so, so yeah, they sent the ascension of Jesus is so important. Right. Yeah. Like, that's it. Right. He's there. <laughs> right. Yes. We're going to talk about it next week. Chapter eight talks about, you know, he's at the right hand of God, mm-hmm. you know, and we, we, you can't get closer. Right. Yeah. You, you know, this is it. And we can, we can pray and talk to Jesus and, 
You know, that author said that praying in Jesus' name is a powerful testimony that our high priest always lives to intercede for us. Uh, Jesus is the guy, you know, he's in heaven ministering Mm -hmm. on our behalf, praying for us. Um, We don't have to go through anybody else. There's no, uh, we shouldn't be worried about, uh, you know, what, how, how we structure prayer or what goes on. Is there some secret, you know, uh, code to, to make sure that our prayers are heard. No, I mean, yeah. you know, Jesus is there on our behalf. And, and I suppose Paul talked about those, uh, kind of the same idea in Romans 8 again. You get to verses 26 and 27. He talks about the Spirit interceding for us. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think this is the same formula. It's the same idea, right, that, that we have this pathway to God, yeah. and, uh, and there's no need to complicate it. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we don't have to. Uh, we were uh, we we're driving home from vacation, and Sherry uh, put on a podcast, and it was this guy talking about prayer. He's talking about prayer and fasting, and and uh, and this this is a topic that gets a little hairy, and so we don't need to dive into this too much. But he was talking about um, well, he has this prayer language that mm-hmm. he uses in prayer. And so he speaks in tongues. He's got this prayer language, and uh, and he literally said, I. I laughed out loud as, as I'm driving around because he literally said, uh, I, I got so good at this that it was an act of the will to pray in this prayer language in, in my prayer. And I thought, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was sure. And, uh, sort of maybe contradicts the whole yeah. gift of the spirit thing, yeah. but sure. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I, we don't need to dive into this too much. And, and I, I'm not even pointing fingers at folks who have prayed in tongues or have a prayer language or whatever. They've experienced that. All I'm saying is if you're like me and that's never occurred in your life, mm-hmm. you know, you've never spoken in tongues in a worship service, you've never prayed in a different language and in, uh, in your own personal time of worship, man, don't worry about it. Yeah. Right. This is okay yep. because there's no need for it. You know, Jesus, Jesus is interceding on our behalf. Mm hmm. You know, he, he didn't, he didn't say he, in fact, when he taught about prayer, he said, don't go on babbling like the pagans, right. you know, and, and, uh, uh, he said, you know, you, it's okay. You know, just, just say your prayers and, uh, he would have said in Hebrew or Aramaic mm-hmm. or Greek or whatever, probably Aramaic to that audience. He would have said, just go ahead and pray in Aramaic. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Don't, don't worry about it. I mean, just pray in English. It's going to be fine right. because Jesus is interceding for us. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I just think this is a great, great hope, uh, for us. It's a great hope for us because it, to me, it just so, radically simplifies this whole process. It really does. Uh, yeah. yeah. We, we have this opportunity to get our message straight through. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and even when we're unsure what to pray, we, we can just kind of rest in that relationship. And when we just acknowledge that, I, I don't think there's a need for a secret language. Yeah. You know, we can just acknowledge, God, I'm not sure what to pray right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he's already interceding and for he hears us. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so amazing because I, I think it's powerful that we acknowledge that, and I think it's powerful that we come before God and just admit kind of our own weakness and our own inadequacies and all of those things. But that's not even what the passage says to do. Mm-hmm. It says that He's always and forever. Right. <laughs> you know, He's already doing it. Yeah. And uh, and so uh, it, it's just awesome. I I think it's great encouraged it. Mm-hmm. encouragement to me when I think yeah. about uh, something that sometimes I wonder, am I doing this good enough? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that... yeah, this chapter is just, well, the, the second half that we're studying is just yeah, so encouraging, just thinking about all these layers of not just right. our salvation, right? but we're talking about the relational aspect and yeah. just what you're saying, like this simplify, like simplifying our prayer life. Right. And like we've talked about uh, the short prayer, like Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right. Yeah, and he, yeah. he hears that. Right, and it's effective, and yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So don't be discouraged. You know, don't worry about 
uh, being spiritual enough or whatever, committed enough or whatever it is, you have the opportunity to, to just go before the throne room mm-hmm. with great confidence because uh, Jesus has done what the law couldn't do. He's justified us and sanctified us and is sanctifying us and mm-hmm. has uh, ma- g- given us this great hope and, and intercedes on our behalf. Such a powerful message and, yeah. and glad we got to talk about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Yep.